were sort of the kids from the plains of Texas. We had no furniture. One phone line. And you did a silly thing like quit to try to start your own computer company. People must have thought you were nuts. Compact is the story of how David takes on Goliath. It's analogous to somebody saying, we're going to put Google out of business. IBM always had this mentality that it is the king of the world. They don't call it Big Blue for nothing. Everyone else was struggling to get a permanent foothold. I think anyone else in the computer business ought to be very frightened. There was no doubt they were just absolutely trying to, to kill everybody else. Compact. Compact. Compact computer. Compact. Compact portable computer. An incredibly revolutionary idea. A handle, wow. People wanted to go home over the weekend and finish their work before Monday. They grabbed a portable. Salesmen used to demonstrate how rugged it is by taking it and dropping it. Couldn't build them fast enough. We're sold out. Enjoy it while you can, because IBM's going to have a portable and then it's sayonara. What's IBM going to do to shut you down? What came down from on top is you better not lose. And that was just in IBM's blood. The way you were supposed to deal with IBM, a smile and a handshake in one hand and a knife to stab them in the back with the other hand. Compact Computer will announce the world's fastest model could make Big Blue green with envy. They handed us the keys to the PC City and we took them. I'd like to tell you about Compaq's new Portable 2 computer. Only one company in history has exceeded $1 billion in sales in its first five years. The company was Compaq Computer Corporation. Maybe this thing is bigger than we thought. Compaq has yet to really falter. First, Compaq took on the big boys and now must fight to stay. They were going to come after us and they weren't going to back off. IBM controlled the marketplace. I don't think we were ever trying to take down the biggest company, ever. We were trying to survive. We will defeat them in the end. The wild Texans who came from nowhere and made a stake in the high-tech industry. Can you get all the little guys together and beat Goliath? You cannot get to the iPhone without the original compact portable. Guys, that was a really good trailer. Well, thank you, and thanks for having us. <laughs> well, thank you for being here. And I kind of want to just dive right in, because I have so many questions. But I guess I'll start with maybe the obvious one. Why, why did this film need to be made? Where did it come from? I love that question. <laughs> Five years ago, um, I decided the story of Compact was getting lost, that nobody really knew. I mean. A lot of people knew about a successful company, but they didn't know what we did that, that molded the industry into what it is today. So I decided it, it, we needed a book and I needed to write it. Mm -hmm. And that was really hard. But after uh, about three years, uh, this book was published. Uh, and it tells the story in great detail, but it didn't get out there very broadly. And then just serendipitously, I ran into uh, the son of a good friend of mine at, at his brother's wedding, and it happened to be Ross Dinnerstein, mm -hmm. Hollywood producer. And uh, he said, I've read your book, and I think it's really interesting, and I think it would make a good documentary. And that led to Jason. Yeah, and, and Ross came to me through our other producer, Glenn Zipper, who's a friend of mine, and I read the book, um, sort of told me a little bit about you know the story. I knew a little bit about it. Um, but uh, after I read it and then got to meet Rod, um, I was drawn in. There was, to me, there was a great narrative there, and it was a story that hadn't been told, and it's a story that impacts us all, and we just don't really realize it. So all those things kind of combined, and then um, it was really appealing to me to sort of play around with this uh, nostalgia factor of uh, <laughs> the 1980s. Uh, I grew up in the 80s. I remember my first computers, and um, to be able to play around with all the old footage and uh, music, to play around with you know 80s sounding, the synth sound of the 1980s and things like that was just um, a big draw for me as well. And Jason, I find this really fascinating because uh, the work for which you might be best known is a documentary called Facing Fear, which is so dramatically different in scope and tone. Was it, was it difficult trying to put something like this together? Well, I, I think one of the other reasons I was drawn to this project was, uh, as you said, I, I, most of my career I've worked on some pretty heavy subject matter. <laughs> 
and I could go even as far as saying depressing. Um, so this was um, this was going to be a really, to me, it was a fun film. It was going to be a fun project to do, and all those things I mentioned about playing around with archival footage and music and, and stuff like that. And there was a great narrative, this David versus Goliath story, to tell. So um, I, you know, I like to change things up. I don't want to be put into a box and make the same type of film every time I go out to make a project. So um, it was just, it was, it was going to be a bit of a challenge for sure. It was mm -hmm. a heavy archival film, but it was also going to be a fun project. And it has been. <laughs> so you mentioned the sort of compact versus IBM, which is the central conflict in the story. You refer to that as a David and Goliath story. And Rod, I want to ask you, throughout the film, we sort of get the sense that compact did really, really well. But they did well, at least partially because IBM is sort of dumb and lumbering and huge. Did you guys feel like that while you were in the thick of things? Not at all. Hmm. We respected IBM greatly. In fact, I would go beyond David versus Goliath. You know, David versus Goliath was over in a short time, but right. this is more like David versus Goliath meets Indiana Jones. Because <laughs> it happened over and over and over again. I mean, if you go through the film, it's not one, it's many of those. Mm -hmm. And finally, it leads to the climax where you know, we organize the industry and, and push IBM aside. But it was um, never stopped uh, respecting IBM. And I wouldn't say we feared them. We respected it enough to try to stay out of their way, but they kept coming after us and sort of almost forced us to, to take some pretty serious actions. Right. And so through the 80s, you've reached tremendous success. Obviously, the Compact Portable, your first sort of runaway hit, paved the way for a lot of other really incredible hardware. At the end of that decade, though, IBM really kind of forces your hand. So they introduced their PC2, which in a lot of ways was a precursor to like their OS2, their new operating system. And you and the Gang of Nine, as it's called, is sort of forced to band together and make a stand. Can you, can you give us a sense of what that was like, teaming up with everybody and, and going for it like that? Well, you almost have to set the stage of just how dire it was. Mm. So here was this open industry standard you know, literally hundreds of companies were thriving in this environment. IBM didn't like it. And so they came out with a proprietary model. The amazing thing to me was all of the other compatible companies bought a license to go build clones of the, of the PS2. Mm -hmm. And it was a dead end street because they controlled the advance of technology and they, uh, they demanded a 5% royalty. And so everybody just sort of ignored all that and, and, and was following them. Compaq was the only one that held out because we were trying to figure out a way, how can we stop this? I mean, this is IBM. What we finally figured out is we, we were the only company that had the technology to actually do a better bus, that is a 32-bit high-speed bus, but that was fully backward compatible. But we knew if we came out with Compaq's bus versus IBM's, we would lose that battle. IBM's brand was just so strong. So what we did is we developed the bus, and then we gave it to everybody else. Now, from IBM's side, they weren't worried because they knew if the industry got together in a coalition, nothing would ever happen. Sure. And if it did, it wouldn't be very good. So when we came out with the, uh, the announcement, uh, I th I'm sure they said, big deal. But it was already there. We had designed it. We had showed it to all the other companies. And so it was, it was ready to go. And... Uh, and, and as, as uh, the guy from IBM, Bill Allett, says in the movie, uh, maybe this is bigger than we think. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Like, one of the most fascinating things to me about watching this film isn't just getting a sense of Compaq's role. Because, I mean, for people of a certain age, Compaq is just sort of this footnote in computing history. I think that's fair to say. Um, but a lot of the things that we see sort of in technology and the environment surrounding technology today, I think, is directly attributable to you guys. So I was just at the Apple event last week, and, and, and Tim Cook had Sia on stage at the end to perform and, and have a, to give us all of a good time. And you guys pioneered that. That was your idea way back when. You know, it was, it, to me, it sort of represented the, the, the out-of-the-box thinking that was all over Compaq. So here we have a guy that's, you know, uh, responsible for setting up all of our announcements. And it's, it's actually our third major announcement, and we have the Pointer Sisters come out <laughs> and sing on stage, I'm so excited. Now, on the surface, it looks really silly. I mean, it's 10 o'clock in the morning, and, and these uh, ladies are in bright colors and are trying <laughs> to act like they're awake and bouncing around on stage singing, I'm so excited. And yet, it was so interesting to everybody that uh, it really attracted a lot of people to come see it. 
what he left out was that they're actually also standing on a life-size version of a of the computer. Wait, really? That didn't come day. across super well yeah, in the you, in the film. Well, the, the archival what? footage is a little old, but I, I mean, we had a blast when I first got all this archival footage, and I, I started seeing. I saw the Pointer Sisters. I saw Irene Cara and. Uh, David Copperfield and you know Rod comes out of a box with David Copperfield as part of a magic <laughs> trick and um, and they, they but they had these these were the A listers of of the 1980s they they were getting the biggest names at the time I mean the Pointer Sisters were at the height of their uh, popularity when they brought them in and the same thing with Irene Cara was when Flashdance had come out so these guys were getting the biggest names in the business to come out and do this and this doesn't even go into the commercial campaign which. They, uh, they also had with John Cleese, which was groundbreaking in its own sense. Right, which I found sort of, in hindsight, very intelligent, because you had IBM with their Charlie Chaplin ads, which, which just by dint of who was in it was only ever going to appeal to a certain demographic of people. But here you come along with John Cleese, this hilarious, absurd British man, being funny and smart about your products. That's... That was brilliant. What kind of went into the decision to use him? And well, you know, on the surface, uh, John Cleese really was only known by a, a niche, you right. know, the Monty Python uh, uh, aficionados almost. But, but you're right, he, he delivered the message so well. And once I saw how he could deliver the, you know, I love the one uh, uh, where he says, uh, this decision was sound. Wrong, but sound. Makes you want to cry, doesn't it? <laughs> I am crying. You know, it's John Cleese, only John Cleese could deliver that and, and, and really make it work. But then we did, we did those commercials. Actually, our first major TV commercials were at the 1984 Olympics. And that mm -hmm. sort of all came together in the summer of 1984. And that really got the name out there because of the, uh, the Olympics background. It's really fascinating to me because your, your history, you are the co-founder, one of three, uh, one of the ideas you guys had kicked around was to start a Mexican restaurant, I believe, which uh, I'm sort of glad didn't take off because now we have, we live in the future that we live in, at least partially because of you guys. But uh, the story for you at Compaq maybe doesn't end so happily. So in 1991, your friend and IBM's, or excuse me, Compaq's not only chairman, but first investor, he sunk the first $750,000 in the Compaq. Ben Rosen sort of orchestrates your ouster from the company. Uh, what was going through your head, and what did you learn from that? Well, you know, it had been a 10-year run, mm -hmm. unbelievably fast-moving, and uh, I, was, I was getting kind of burned out. We had, we had never had a stumble for nine years, and then in, in 1991, <clears throat> that's the first Gulf War, right. which created a recession, so PC sales slowed. Six of our top dealers merged into three, so there was inventory to work off. And then to top all that off, the dollar strengthened unexpectedly, and so our overseas sales. So the bottom line was we had a loss, our first loss ever. Right. And so that led to sort of a, a really uh, study your navel and figure out what you need to be doing. And we, we knew we had to take our brand and move it downscale into the low end without giving up the quality. And the disagreement was really over how fast to do that. Now, the fact that I was sort of uh, burned out, I think, led to me... Uh, not being as cooperative as I should have been, and so it led to me uh, being replaced. You know, I think it was probably, under the circumstances, time for, for somebody to come in and, and, you know, with fresh energy and, and take the reins at that point in time. Uh, I think we could have done it a lot better. You know, it, it, was, uh, it was kind of messy, but, but the bottom line is they went on uh, three years later to pass IBM and become the world leader in PCs. The only upside, obviously, now to this departure for Rod was it gave us a dramatic end to the movie. <laughs> so, um, you know, this many years later, I guess you can look back on it that way. You know, I, in the book, I, I didn't talk about that. It was, it just felt like it, you know, the book was a, telling the story of what Compaq did, and that was sort of not related to it almost. But when Jason did his thing, which is to make it an interesting story and put the drama in it, uh, you know, I'm fine with that. I think it, it did add a lot to the movie to, to show just how dramatic that was because the culture at Compaq was, was amazing. It was probably no other company quite like it. And I was the leader of that. Right. And, uh, you know, one of the things that I felt really bad about was leaving uh, created a lot of worry and concern and almost fear in the people. You know, a lot of, uh, a lot of concern about what are we going to do now? You know, Rod's the leader of the culture and all of that. Well, they did fine, but uh, I, I wish they hadn't had to go through that. I think it's also fascinating to just explore 
in a way, just how much you were loved by your employees. So when, when all of this went down, I believe I read that uh, employees took out an ad saying, Rod, we love you. And this all stems from very early in the film where you say, you know, you wanted to start a company with your three colleagues, and you basically just wanted to create a good place to work. Those were your words. That is actually the way we started out. Uh, we had no grand idea that we were going to become a PC leader, much less, you know, just, just a player in the, in the industry. But when the idea for the portable came along, it was, it was just too good to pass up. So we, we chased that, went after it, got funding for it, and went on from there. But the early success only drove the point home stronger to me that the only way we're going to keep this together is to keep the culture, to actually understand what's allowed us to do this and then work to keep it as we added hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people over the next few years. Culture is obviously part of it, but I want to get a sense for both of you. What, what sort of happened inside Compact? What were you guys excellent at that allowed you to achieve this kind of success? Well, in the early days, the question I would get asked is, uh, what's the most important thing? And after I thought about it a while, it, it, was, it was really clear to me, you know, there, everything is important. If you're going to succeed, especially on the scale that Compact did, you got to have a great design team. You got to have a great production team. You got to control the quality. You got to market it right. You got to get your distribution right. You got to control the, the, uh, the finances. I mean, many companies went in, in that era, you know, 83, 84, went out of business, not from bad products, but mm. from too much success. They couldn't handle it. They didn't have the infrastructure. And part of that was our TI background. We came in with, uh, with a lot of experience, and that allowed us to put systems and infrastructure in early to be able to manage the growth if it happened to come. And boy, did it come. I mean, it came in, in big <laughs> waves. And so we were just lucky that we had put it in, in place. And I'll just add, just from my perspective in making the film, and I think Rod will acknowledge this, there, there certainly was a little bit of luck involved um, with it all. And I, <laughs> and I, I think the other thing that helped him was, you know, we, the film is called Silicon Cowboys. They're from Texas. They're in Houston. Everything was happening out in Silicon Valley. IBM is in New York. Um, they were outsiders, and they were able to sort of get the troops together and get this going sort of unnoticed for a while. And then when they started to kind of appear on the radar screen, IBM just thought it was a blip, and they, they didn't really acknowledge it as something that was going to be any sort of threat to them or that could ever make a dent in their business. And I, I think being down in Houston and being away from it all actually mm -hmm. helped them uh, in that extent. There's no doubt about that. See, before IBM entered the market, it was Apple and Commodore and Radio Shack, and, and they didn't fear IBM because they knew IBM didn't understand the market. So here comes IBM. They introduced the PC. Well, wait a minute. In, a, in about a year, they're the leader of the market. And after two years, they own, you know, 35% of the market. So something unexpected happened. IBM's brand took PCs into business like nobody else had been able to do. And so here was a market that all of a sudden now had turned upside down. But from IBM's perspective, hey, we entered the market. It was, you know, it was already solidified without us, and, and we took over. So here's this little guy in Texas building a portable. All we got to do is put out an IBM portable. And they're gone. And by the way, everybody in the world believed that. All the press and all the financial people. Our stock, just the rumor of IBM coming out, we'd just gone public at $11. It dropped to $3.75 in about a month. And so people really believed IBM was going to put us out of business. And they didn't. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I've been jumping around to a lot of different points in Compact's history. I think that's almost unavoidable because it is such a big, meaty story. Jason, what was it like trying to encapsulate all of that into a documentary that I believe runs 76 minutes? Yeah, I mean, it was tough. Um, we had an idea of the story we wanted to tell. Um, I think we knew from, from the outset that the, the company was started in 81, and so that's obviously kind of where we start. And, uh, and I think we knew that we kind of wanted to end with Rod, and it became clear uh, that a lot of the story was about Rod and the impact he had on the company. Um, and, and in Houston, to be, to be honest. And so, you know, Rod left in 91. So that gives us 10 years. Um, but then it was still, I mean, there was hundreds of hours of archival footage. There were many product announcements that were hugely successful, and we had to figure out which ones uh, made the most sense. The portable is sort of the big one, and that's sort of the star of the show, if you will. But we do go into some of, the, you know, some of the other big announcements, including the Gang and I, which we just talked about, their 386 computer, which was the fastest computer at the time. And I think it had 14 megabytes of RAM. 
Is that right? <laughs> um, enough for now and for future. Yeah, that's the film. <laughs> they say enough for now and for the future. Um, so, uh, but yeah, there, there was a lot. We, but we, we had an idea. And then the other thing is we wanted to look at some of the, you know, the pitfalls in the company. They had success after success, but there were problems that went on internally and then leading to when uh, Rod was pushed out. So we wanted to make sure we gave that its fair shake and put some emotion into the film as well. I think the one thing that is most striking about the message in the film is that we owe a lot of what we have now, I think, to Compaq and to you, Rod. I mean, I've got an iPhone right here, and I'll, I think there, there is a, uh, a culture of excellence in mobility that you guys kind of started with the Compaq Portable, and, and the film sort of ends with a bunch of people saying, hey, this is all because of you, and to which I say, thank you, and also, this is all your fault. Um, yeah. Do you consider yourself the sort of forefather of this, this world that we live in? Is that, is that too big a reach? Well, for me personally, I think it's too big a reach. But if you step back and look at the whole picture, there are a lot of forces that came together when the iPhone came out. That was, to me, that was a whole new era that started with the iPhone. Right. But what led up to that, and, and, and most people haven't ever thought about this, to, to have the iPhone come out in 07, Steve Jobs died in, in 11. Mm. And so the technology had to get to a certain point for him to be able to really invent that at right. that point in time. And the technology, it's really clear to me, would not have advanced nearly as rapidly through the 90s and the early 2000s if IBM, IBM had succeeded in sort of closing the, uh, the technology and, and uh, letting it come out at the pace IBM wanted. So the open industry standard, by winning, mm -hmm. allowed technology to flourish, really, I call it the golden age of, of computer technology, advancing through the 90s and the 2000s, because it, it, you didn't have the dispersion of, of energy on a bunch of different platforms. You know, many computers, mainframes, throughout history, all computer industries had been proprietary. And so if you wrote software on this one, you really didn't have the resources to write it on that one. So it was very dispersed. But when the industry standard came along, all software companies could focus on the industry standard. So a lot more innovation in software and peripherals and uh, display and storage and all of those things, they could focus on one architecture. That allowed it to really advance rapidly. Yeah, and I, I just want, from my perspective, when we were making the film, it was clearly obvious um, with, the, with the portable, this was the first time that people sort of had a seed planted in their head that you could take your work with you, that you could leave the office and grab this 28-pound uh, sewing machine, <laughs> which is what it looked like, uh, with a handle on it, a leather handle, and you could go home from work and, and do your work at home. And that was revolutionary. Um, nowadays, you know, we're all on our iPhone. Everything is done mobile. We, we don't do anything um, on a laptop <laughs> pretty much anymore <laughs> or on a desktop. Um, but this was the first time that that idea of a mobile world was in people's heads. And I think that was a huge impact. And it was because it was compatible was a big part of why people were drawn to it and it, it worked so well, but just the idea of being able to, to walk away with something and get your work done was, was huge. So it really was a parallel uh, effort from Compaq throughout the, the 80s and, and the 90s because without either one, we wouldn't have gotten where we, uh, where the industry wouldn't have gotten where it got to because yeah, the portable started it all, and then Compaq ended up leading. Late in the 90s, we were the first one to come out with a notebook computer, uh, and full function was our, our tagline almost. It's like everybody came out with these niche, small computers, but they didn't really do the job. We were the first one to come out and really drive the size down, down, mm -hmm. down. And that's what led to finally getting down to the iPhone level. But without the performance and upscale desktop business, that we could go then fight IBM and stop them from taking over, the portable business would have sort of died at some point anyway. So both of those together, really, we had to, we had to really work on and keep them both going or it, it wouldn't have worked. I've got one final question. I know we've got to throw it over to the audience tonight, but just I really can't help myself. Rod, you've served as an investor and an advisor to startups in your life after Compaq. What advice do you have to entrepreneurs and people who want to build things as a person who's been there and done it and taken on these enormous powers? You know, the best advice I think I can give is to, uh, before you go start your company, go get some experience. You know, I talk to a lot of people out of college saying, you know, I want to go start a company. And I say, well, if you got to do it, do it. But 
your best shot is going to be after you go spend a few years in a, in a good company and learn how the world works. Because coming out of college, you may know a lot of stuff, but you do not yet know how the world really works in business, and, and there's so many other dimensions to it. So w one of the big advantages the Compact team had, we had been you know, 10, 15 years of experience in a good company, TI or others, and the team came together with a lot of uh, really good background in how to manage growth and how to manage people, and, and that, that helped us. So that's that's number one recommendation, is go get your experience and then go take your best shot. Awesome, guys, thank you so much. Let's throw it over to the audience for some Q&A. Gentlemen, good morning. So I have a question for both of you. Jason, what was your favorite part about putting the documentary together? And Rod, while you were doing the interviews, was there a particular moment in time that felt surreal to you that that sort of thing happened in your career? Um, so for me, I think, I sort of hit it on a little bit. It was, it was a lot of fun to sort of play around with the pop culture references from the 80s and the, all the archival footage. We have, you know, William Shatner in the film, a clip of him. We have a clip of King Kong Bundy, a wrestler from the 80s. Um, we were able to sort of pull a lot of it in all the John Cleese commercials. Um, and then playing around with the music was a lot of fun. Our composer, Ian Hulquist, is a very, very talented composer. He's from the band Passion Pit. Um, and we had a lot of fun with that synth sound from the 80s and, and sort of playing around with that. And then, you know, it was great sort of getting to know the story, meeting all these guys, and we had some fun. We went down to the, the original House of Pies, the, the pie shop in Houston, where they actually drew up the first sketch of the portable computer on the back of a placemat, and we took the restaurant over and we shot in the actual place where that all happened, and we did a recreation of it. And it was a lot of fun to, uh, to get in there and, and, and do that. So there was a lot of stuff. It was, like I said, this was a really fun film for me to make. And, and some of the interviews got heavy, I have to be honest. We had people crying in interviews because of the emotion that they had when, when Rod was ousted because he had such an impact there. So I think uh, a combination of all that. Well, you know, pretty much all of it was surreal. Um, like I said, our, we didn't have this grandiose goal. <clears throat> and when it took off and, you know, press came and uh, I would be doing these interviews and trying to explain this, uh, you know, it was hard for me not to say, we're just lucky. <laughs> I mean, there was so much luck involved, luck and timing. I mean, just, just the age I was when PCs took off. All of that came together to give us the opportunity. Now, we... We saw the opportunity and we took it. But as I sat through each, actually each product announcement, which is sort of what punctuated my life for that whole decade, uh, it was very surreal to have, uh, we were just talking about as we were coming over here, the Palladium, that's nearby. Uh, we did our 386 announcement there and it was giant audience. And we had the Garden Moore from Intel and Bill Gates from Microsoft talking about how the important the 386 was. And it was, it was just surreal, you know. It was, here we are taking this step out in front of IBM. Everybody thought we were surely dead now because we, you know, you get in front of IBM, it's like getting in front of a steamroller. But we understood that if we make this thing run all the, all the existing software, it's, it's a safe bet. And so I think it was a surprise to the industry as well as to IBM that this thing really did succeed and took off. And that, that just fueled the growth and the, uh, the, the image and brand of Compaq even further. Hey, gentlemen, thank you for being here. So uh, what, 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 do you, what, do you, what are your perception in technology? What, what will change in 10 years from now, like in five, 10 years from now? What would you think uh, uh, the change of the technology? Because uh, all these social media uh, outlets, they have, we have so many of them. So what, what would you see in technology in five, ten, five, 10 years from now? Well, I think there'll be shakeout in the uh, social media. <clears throat> it's the same pattern. you know started up automobile industry in the early 1900s. Uh, there's a bunch of companies in and there's a shakeout. Same thing with PCs. Social media, people are going out and finding niches and trying to do that better than the big companies are. And in many cases, they'll succeed, but a lot of cases, it, it, they'll, they'll either get bought or they'll go away. Uh, you know, I don't think it's possible to see where the next big thing is coming from. Uh, the only, well, the two big things happened since the PC era. One was the internet. And, you know, everybody could pretty much see that was going to be a big deal, but they had no idea, you know, where it was all going. And I don't think that's done yet. I think the Internet will be a, a driver of a lot of new uh, inventions and innovations. Uh, and then the iPhone and iPad come along, and that really was a vector change in the direction of people using computing power. 
And that's going to run. The combination of Internet and, and let's say, tablets will, will go a long way. But now it gets down to the services and the software, and I think for the next 10 years there will be a lot of innovation there. But you can't see it coming. I don't think Jobs knew when he came up with the iPhone. He knew it was the coolest thing ever, but he didn't know where it was going to go. Uh, I saw it really when the second iPhone came out. It, something gelled in my mind, this is going to be a game changer. But until I saw it, I, I didn't know that all that was, was possible. So it's, it's one of those things he, you can think about it and you know, people can guess about it. Uh, but you just kind of got to watch, and, and the trick is to pick it out early. Uh, hello. Uh, I have two questions. Um, you mentioned that this was like a David and Goliath story. Do you think that's happening right now? And what do you hope your audience take away from this documentary? Um, you know, it's a lot harder now to, to have a David come along and not get stomped on. Um, because the, the environment when we started, it really was... It was the Wild West. You know, the Cowboys analogy really fits well, but both because of Texas and because it was wide open plains. You know, you could go out there and you could try anything. We happened to try the thing that, that turned out to be a lot bigger than we thought. Uh, go after Google. Sounds kind of hard to me. <laughs> Apple. You know, they're entrenched. Samsung's doing a pretty good job of, of, of fighting, but, uh, you know, uh, Apple doesn't look like it's going away for, for the foreseeable future. So. I would say, uh, you know, it's hard to come up with a, a, a good analogy right now, but uh, it's always possible. It always is right there on the edge, just below the surface. Somebody's going to come up with a way to really, really challenge what the status quo out there. All right, well, I think that's it from the audience, guys. Let's give it up for Jason Cohen and Rod Canyon. <laughs> Silicon Cowboys goes live tomorrow uh, in theaters and on video streaming services. Thank you so much for being here. It's been a blast. Thank thanks you. so much. And go to SiliconCowboysMovie.com and all the info is there. So thanks again. And check out Rod's book while you're at it. Open. Actually, the, uh, the book goes into a lot more detail than the, the, uh, the video, but, but the film is much more interesting. So <laughs> they both go together. <laughs>